Good morning. morning. Would you turn with me to Micah 5 if you have a copy of the Bible with you? I just want to read something I, I saw on Twitter this morning, and it sort of grabbed my attention and kind of broke my heart a little bit. This person wrote, church is hard these days. Doesn't really matter if you go to the service. No one will talk to you or acknowledge your existence. And I thought, may it never be in this outpost of the kingdom. That every person who walks in that door would be warmly greeted and invited into deep fellowship in Christ. And that's, just, that's not just me and the staff's job. That's our job to steward together. I don't want to be any lonely people in this church. I want everyone to be connected deeply to Christ and to the body. Amen? Okay. That had nothing to do with my sermon. Um, but I'm going to ask you to pray right now, just for really briefly and silently, Pray that God would really use this time powerfully as we look at Micah chapter 5. Would you go ahead and do that? And then we'll dive in together. Let's pray. And we said together, amen. Speaking of Twitter, so if Twitter had been around in Micah's day, so end of the 8th century BC, if Twitter was around in Micah's day, here are some of the topics that might have been trending on Twitter. There'd be a lot of tweets criticizing Judah's weak political leaders. There'd be a lot of tweets expressing concern over escalating tensions with the foreign adversary. There'd be tweets expressing concern about the rising cost of commodities in Micah's day. And there'd be an overall sort of uncertainty about the future. Uh, In a society characterized by injustice and rapid moral decline. Of course, some people would express a more cheerful, optimistic outlook. I mean, some tweets would would put a kind of false confidence in the latest military technology in Judah. You know, horses and chariots and fortified cities, that kind of a thing. Some tweets would put false hope in the panoply of the ancient Near Eastern gods that they assumed had their back. The false prophets would definitely have been on Twitter. You know what they'd be tweeting? They would tweet, peace, peace, when there was no peace. And the citizens in Judah, who were just choosing to kind of bury their heads in the sand and ignore the coming crisis, well, they would probably shoot off tweets like, hey, tonight we're going to party like it's 699. You get it? You don't get it, do you? Turn of the century? Anyway, I guess there's no Prince fans here. Well, it turns out that citizens like Micah were right to be concerned. Because by 701 BC, the situation had totally disintegrated. The Assyrians, who were the world superpower at the time, They came down with their army of mercenaries and captured all the cities around Jerusalem. Many thousands of people were killed. Many thousands were carried off into captivity. The survivors, including Micah and King Hezekiah, they were all held up behind the city walls of Jerusalem, I guess hoping for a miracle, because the Assyrian army completely surrounded the city. That seems to be what the context is here in verse 1. Look with me on the screen. Micah chapter 5, verse 1. This is what it says. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. In other words, they were hemmed in 
to the city surrounded by an invading army. With a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. In other words, Jerusalem was surrounded. Their king was totally humiliated. And God's people were sitting ducks. And it's in this context that Micah kind of lifts his eyes above the horizon and sees a day where help would come from a very unlikely place, the little town of Bethlehem. Have you heard of it? You know what a one-stoplight town is? Bethlehem was like a no-stoplight town. They didn't even have a Walmart, much less a, a Starbucks. It wasn't even on the map. It's not even listed in the 115 cities of, of Judah that uh, Joshua wrote about when they came in and, and took the land. Its only claim to fame was that that's where King David was from. But Micah's prophecy here in chapter 5 is going to kind of put Bethlehem on the map because it predicts that that's where the Messiah would be born. Micah 5 is all about this promised ruler, a descendant of David, only the greater David, whom God would one day send to shepherd his people. And so from this ideal ruler, God is going to bring salvation for his people. He's going to protect them from their enemies. And get this, he's even going to purge their ungodliness from them so that they could really live in true devotion to God. That's what we want to zoom in on this morning as we think about this passage. And, you know, I'm not sure what's trending in your Twitter feed today, what kind of, you know, distressing things people are arguing and fighting about, elections and inflation and so many things like that. I don't know what's distressing you in your life right now, what you walked in with this morning kind of pressing upon your heart. All I know is that there's a ruler who was born in Bethlehem. He is the savior of everyone who trusts in him. And I'm praying that you would lift your eyes above the horizon and see this glorious Christ. That, that he would be, you know, the one that you adore and follow and live for. And, and I've been praying for you this week that God would do great things through his word this morning. So that's the plan. You all see where we're going? Are you with me? Okay. First of three points on the screen. Number one, I'm simply calling it promised ruler. Promised ruler. Look with me just at verse two of Micah 5. This is what it says. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah. What is Ephrathah? Well, that's just the district where Bethlehem, the town was. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me. That is, for who? For God, for Yahweh. This ruler is going to be a servant of Yahweh, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. So Micah says a ruler's going to be born in what town? Bethlehem. You know, I told my daughter if I was preaching this sermon tomorrow, I would have titled it Christmas in July. You get it? Because it's an Advent passage. It's one that we often think about during Christmas time. In fact, do you remember the story of the wise men? Do you remember the magi who come from the east? And they're searching for a newborn king, one who had been born king of the Jews. They saw his star rise. And so they come looking for him and they, and they find Herod. And Herod gets all nervous because Herod is the king. Well, he's really a client king for the Romans ruling over Palestine. But he's nervous because, you know, he sees this as a threat. So he wants to find the child first to worship him, he says, but it's really to snuff him out. And so what does Herod do? He goes to the scribes. And he asks the scribes, where did the prophets say that the Messiah would be born? And of course, they tell him what? Bethlehem in Judea. In fact, they quote Micah 5 too. 
which by the way had been written 700 years before, right? So turn of the 8th century, about 700 years before Jesus is born. And this tells us that for centuries, the Jewish people understood this to be a prediction about where the Messiah would be born, this promised ruler for God's people. You with me so far? But was Micah also saying that this ruler would be divine? That his origin would stretch all the way back into eternity past? I mean, what does verse 2 say? Um, Whose coming forth is from of old and from ancient days? Is, is he saying that this ruler would actually, you know, be from before creation? Well, Many scholars say that this isn't a statement about Jesus' divinity, but that it simply connects Micah's prophecy with an earlier promise that God made to David about one of his descendants who would sit on the throne someday. And I would say, even if they're right, there's another prophet, in fact, a contemporary of Micah, Isaiah, who made unambiguous statements about the Messiah's divinity. And that's another Advent passage, right? Isaiah, 6, uh, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Anybody know what comes next? Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah says that this ruler who is to be born would be mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Same ruler that Mike is talking about here in chapter 5. Speaking of peace, look what Micah goes on to say about what God's Messiah would do when he came to rule God's people. Pick it up in verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 3. Pick it up in verse 3. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and what? Shepherd, Shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be their what? Peace. In peace. Verse 3 is actually pointing to an indefinite period of time in between Micah's prediction and when this ruler would actually come. And it turns out it would be, right, seven centuries. And during this intervening period of time, God's people would, in a sense, be abandoned. So verse 3 says, God, he shall give them Israel up until the time when this ruler is born. And if you know your Bible and if you know your history for that matter, you know that the Jewish people were oppressed by successive pagan empires. The Babylonians, then the, the, Persian, the Medo-Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And God would no doubt was punishing his people for their years of unfaithfulness. And disobedience. But you see, through Micah, God was planting a seed of hope that would one day ripen when Jesus came. He would not be the ruler that they wanted. He wouldn't be the ruler that they deserved. But he would be the ruler that they needed. And if you're here today and you're not used to reading the Bible, I would really encourage you to start reading it. Um, it's amazing how many skeptics of the Bible have not really met, read much of the Bible. And, and I would encourage you to start with one of the four Gospels. You know, one of the four, first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the historical eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life. You know, his birth, his, his life, his death, his resurrection on the third day. In fact, I would love to read through one of the Gospels with you and tell you more about who Jesus is and what it means to, to follow him. I think if you would actually read the Gospels, I think you would find Jesus to be so compelling. In fact, look for the ways that he treats people, especially the outcast and the unlovely. 
Notice how the authors of the Gospels are contrasting what Jesus is like with what the other rulers were like in his day. Notice how the Gospel writers are contrasting Jesus' compassionate rule with the harsh, selfish rule of so many other religious and civil leaders. In fact, if you read the Gospel of John, you'll eventually come to chapter 10 where Jesus said, this is what, he, this is what his rule is like. He said, I am the good shepherd. In other words, he was saying that he cares for and protects his sheep, his followers. Jesus said in John 10, he knows all of them by name. And they know his voice and they follow him. Actually, two times in that passage, Jesus says that eventually the good shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep in self-sacrificing love Friends, that's the kind of ruler that Jesus is. He's, he's strong yet gentle. He's patient. He's infinitely generous, giving even his own life to rescue his sheep. He's not the kind of ruler that any of us deserve, but he's the kind of ruler that all of us need. And he would have you as one of his sheep if you would give yourself to follow him. I would also encourage you, if you're going to read through the Gospels, look for the ways that Jesus speaks about himself and about his ministry. He, he makes like such incredibly bold statements about who he was. You know, in different places in the Gospels, it, he seems to be saying that he's the one fulfilling all of those ancient prophecies by himself, in himself. He even makes claims of divinity. Sometimes implicitly, like, you know, when he forgives people's sins, but sometimes explicitly. You know, like when Jesus said, um, I and the Father are one. Or when he told the religious leaders that he existed before Abraham, the patriarch, who was born 2,000 years before Jesus was even born. How could he say such things? Well, because he's God in the flesh, come to earth. Now, why is that important? Once again, if you're not used to thinking about Christianity, well, because if Jesus was only like this good teacher and, you know, sort of a philanthropist, this really compassionate guy, then there might be some good things we could learn from him, you know, but you certainly like, wouldn't give your life to follow him. But if he really is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, then he actually deserves your whole life and allegiance. Speaking of how Jesus spoke of himself, once again, in John 10, you see he's drawing all this shepherd imagery from Old Testament passages like Micah chapter 5. So again, verse 4, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. That's the, that's the imagery Jesus is drawing from when he talks about who he is in John 10. He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Question, was Micah only speaking of ethnic Israel? In other words, who's, who's the Messiah's flock? Who were his sheep? Did, 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 did Micah foresee that this ruler from Bethlehem would come only for the Jewish people or for non-Jewish people as well? Well, I don't really know what Micah understood about God's plan to bring Jew and Gentile into one flock under the Messiah, but Jesus gives a pretty big hint about what he's up to in John chapter 10, that good shepherd discourse. You know what he told those listening? He's talking to Jewish people and he tells them this, I have sheep who are not of this fold, meaning the Gentiles. He said, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. And you see, that was always the plan, to bless all the nations through Abraham's seed, that is Jesus the Messiah, he would come and gather into his flock people of all the nations. 
If it wasn't clear to those listening to Jesus in John 10, it becomes a lot clearer right before he ascends because he sends his followers to go make disciples of all of the nations and, and to be his witnesses to the very ends of the earth. Interestingly, Micah says in our passage that this ruler from Bethlehem would be great to the ends of the earth. Friends, do you understand that this one little sort of chapter in the Bible is actually connected to the whole story? You know, like, like, a, like a central nervous system, it, it all connects like a beautiful tapestry. It's one story. It, it, it's all about God's plan to redeem through the Messiah people from all the nations and bring them under his care, under his flock. It, it all connects to God's plan to restore everything someday. This whole sin-cursed world and bring all of its brokenness and heal it and replace it with lasting peace. Do you see what verse 4 says? And he shall be their peace. Isn't that so interesting? Do you know something? Peace is not a feeling. Uh, peace is not like a tranquility in the midst of a stressed out world. No, according to Micah, peace is a person. He's the prince of peace. And he shall be, he shall be their, what? Their peace. Paul says almost the same thing in Ephesians 2. You know what he's talking about there? He's talking about Jesus' substitutionary death, which achieves our peace with God and with God's people. Do you understand that? Do you understand that's why Jesus went to the cross? Do you understand that there was hostility between sinful man and a holy God? We were alienated from God because of our willful rebellion. We were opposed to him in our sin, and he was opposed to us in his holiness. But Jesus' atoning death solved that big problem, bridged that colossal gap. Jesus' death achieves, restores our relationship to the God who made and loved us if we trust him. Do you trust him? If you trust him, then there is no more hostility between a holy God and you, even though you still are a sinful person like the person with the microphone right now. Peace is fundamentally peace with God through Jesus Christ. Peace is the, is the absence of hostility, right? We're, we're, we're made right with God, but it's also the presence of his blessing forever in the Messiah as we submit to and live under his rule. Peace is spiritual and relational wholeness in Christ. And how thrilling is it that Micah sees a day when under the Messiah's rule, peace envelops the whole planet. Did you know that, did you know that someday all of creation is gonna flourish and flower under the rule of the Messiah, and everything will be the way it was meant to be. And we'll be there with God. We'll behold the Ancient of Days as we were singing about. You know, my skeptical friend, you know, I don't know who you are, but here's, I wonder if the Christianity you don't believe isn't really Christianity at all. I would encourage you to take another look. You might be utterly surprised that it's actually the fulfillment of your deepest longings for a world with no brokenness that is healed where we live forever and ever in peace under God's rule. I'd love to read through John with you if you'd be willing. Okay, we got to move on. Second point, much shorter than the first. Dual purpose. So for Messiah's people, once the Messiah comes, he has a dual purpose for them. We see that here in these verses. Pick it up in verse seven. By the way, if you're really astute, you notice that I skipped over verse five and six. I had to cut somewhere, okay? See me at the door if you wanna think about verses five and six with me. Pick it up in verse seven for now. 
Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delayed not for a man or wait for the children of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through, treads down and tears in pieces, and there is none to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. Well, these verses suggest that when the Messiah comes, those who live under his rule will have two purposes in the world. Okay, follow me here. Those who live under the Messiah's rule, they will be both a source of blessing in the world, okay, hence the image of of the dew and rains falling on the grass, right? It's going to sprout, it's going to bring blessing. But they'll also be a conquering force in the world. Hence the image of a, of a lion that treads down and tears in pieces. And you think, well, how do these two metaphors fit together? How could, how could God's people be both? And it actually really does work if you think about it. First, under the Messiah, God's people will be a blessing in the world. And John Dixon helped us think about that last week, didn't he? As we looked at um, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. You are the light of the world, Messiah's people. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And for what purpose? That they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Beloved, God intends for his people to be a blessing in the world. There are countless ways in which the world has been blessed by the presence of faithful Christians and the truths that they espouse. What did John say last week? The very first hospitals were established by Christians. The first orphanages, right? They rescued babies discarded in the trash heap, which was totally legal and not seen as unethical at the time of of the first and second century. The very foundation of the civil rights movement was grounded in God's word, teaching on the Imago Dei that every person is made in God's image and has inestimable worth. We can think of so many ways Scripture calls us to be a blessing in the world, pushing back the darkness, bringing renewal and order where there is chaos, most importantly, through the faithful proclamation of Christ and the gospel. But you see, we're also a conquering force in the world that can't be stopped like a lion, according to Micah. How so? Well, what did Jesus say? I will build my church and even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You see, the church's enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil can do nothing to stop God's purposes for his people. This Messiah's name will be great to the ends of the earth as his people Proclaim his name. Do you understand? You following me here? God's people bring blessing, particularly, particularly in places where the, where the light of the gospel is brought, like in Papua New Guinea Pei, right? There's a little new church in that tribe when before they were an unreached people. We sent a missionary. She joined a team. They brought the gospel. There's now a church there. So it's bringing renewal in the jungles of, of Papua New Guinea. But... Where the gospel is not received, the church, hopefully tearfully, announces God's forthcoming judgment for the unrepentant because that's part of our message. That's part of our prophetic witness. So it's both of these two things together, you see. And I think that maybe the the verse in the New Testament that best sort of puts this dual purpose together is in 2 Corinthians where it says, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance of death to death. To the other, a fragrance of life to life. The church invites the world to believe in the hope of the ages, Jesus Christ, and so be saved. But those who will not are also told of God's coming judgment. As a matter of fact, skip down to the very last verse in Micah 5. Look at what it says there. Verse 15 And in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. 
Friend, once again, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, like I said before, you are opposed to God in your sin. And he is opposed to you in his holiness. But he brought you to this place to hear good news about how you could be restored to him and have that enmity removed and actually become an adopted son or daughter in his kingdom. And if you would, on that last day, when the nations are judged and held accountable, you'll be received into his kingdom. Turn and trust in Jesus today. I don't think it's a mistake that you're here. Maybe someone invited you to church today and you needed to hear this news about how you could live forever through Christ. Point number three and, and finally, the purge, the purge. Are you all still with me? Okay, we're almost done. The purge. Look at that in uh, verses 10 through 14. And in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. And I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. And I will cut off sorceries from your hand and you shall have no more tellers of fortunes. And I will cut off your carved images, in other words, your idols and your pillars from among you and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands, and I will root out your Asherah images, another idol, from among you and destroy your cities. Can I just tell you that in Micah's day, God's people had two glaring problems, two glaring deficiencies. Number one, they relied on false securities instead of God. They relied on false securities instead of God. Do you remember what David says in Psalm 20? Remember how he says, hey, some will trust in horses and some in chariots, but not us. We will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Not in Micah's day. No, they trusted in horses and chariots and fortified cities, their military technology, not in the name of the Lord their God. And that was their first glaring deficiency. They trusted in false securities. Here's their second deficiency. It was worldliness. In other words, there was nothing distinct about God's people. They just looked like everybody else. They just looked like and acted like the world. They practiced all the same forms of paganism. Micah mentions it, right? Your sorcery, your tellers of fortune. You're just like the nations around you. They're worshiping all the same false gods. But Micah speaks of a day when God's going to purge. He's going to forever purge his people of all false securities and false worship under the Messiah's rule. So what about us, okay? But let's bring this back to us and then, and then we'll wrap it up. My Christian friends, I would encourage you to look at your life and try to discern where you might be relying on false securities because there are many of them. What should help you sleep well at night is not your strong financial position or that you've just been really successful or, or you know, because I got a really great family. That, that should not be ultimately what helps you sleep well at night. What should help you sleep well at night is that your name is written in heaven, period. Everything else could be taken from you in an instant, but not the Lord, not the hope of the ages. Friends, while people are fretting and fighting right now on Twitter, fretting about which guy standing at the podium last Thursday is going to be back in the White House, or maybe fretting over both options, I don't know, Christians know that their security does not come from whoever is sitting in the White House, but from the one who rules from heaven. He is the sovereign. He is over all kings and over all kingdoms of the earth. So where, what are you hoping in? Where is your real security? Is it on earth or is it in heaven? I would also encourage you to look at your life to discern 
where there may be worldliness instead of godliness. Now, what is that? What, what are we saying? What is worldliness? Well, I've always liked David Wells' definition. He said, worldliness is whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness look strange. It's whatever makes sin look normal and righteousness seem strange. And does sin look normal to you or in your life? Titus 2 says that Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Jesus Christ did not just die so that you can go to heaven someday. He died so that you would live differently now be a light to a dark world. That passage also says that the grace of the gospel trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. Is that how you're seeking to live, my Christian friend? Self-controlled, upright, godly life in this present age? If you do, you will be so out of step with the culture but you'll be right in line with Jesus. Beloved, you've heard me say this before, but how we live as Christians matters greatly. It proves the genuineness of our faith or not. Now, I'm not suggesting that our holiness is what makes us acceptable to God. It's not. It's the righteousness of Christ that makes us acceptable to God, and that's only received by grace. But that grace, Paul says, is transforming. It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And I'm praying for us as a church. You know what I'm praying? I'm praying that God would wean us from all false securities and purge us of all worldliness. My Christian friend, if you're here this morning and you're straying from God, you must hear and heed this warning. Because otherwise, unless you humble yourself under him, he's going to come do it for you and it'll be way more painful. So why not do it now? And if if that purging and that discipline never comes, well, then you're not his to begin with. That's what Hebrews 12 says. So mercifully, hear his merciful warning this morning to turn from that impurity and that ungodliness to follow his will. You see, this purging Micah envisions, I believe, is ultimately fulfilled in the church. It's accomplished through the saving work of the Messiah in the new covenant. And what is the promise of the new covenant? I will put my spirit in them and I will cause them to walk in my ways and obey my rules. And Jesus said that new covenant was established by his blood shed on Calvary's cross. Would you join me in praying that these graces would be evident in our lives, that we would shine like lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? Would you, would you be praying that with me? I've, I've been praying for like revival for, for months. I know that's an old timer's word, renewal for months, that God would bring us to deeper places of repentance as a church, deeper places of fellowship with each other, and deeper places of joy in the gospel. Okay, I am way over time. We'll, we should conclude. Do you, do you know what I meant now by Christmas in July? Because I feel like some of you didn't understand that. You got it now, right? So Micah 5 is all about this ruler who's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to bring salvation for God's people. He's going to protect them from their enemies. He's going to purge them of their ungodliness so that they live in full devotion to him. Jesus is that ruler. Jesus is that Messiah. Friends, look at me, please. Is he your ruler? Is he your Messiah? You know, if heaven had a Twitter handle, (laughs) here's what I think would be trending on Twitter. On heaven's Twitter, Christ is on the throne. He is building his church. 
nothing will stop him. He'll be great to the ends of the earth. He's coming soon. He's going to make all things new. I pray that you would not listen to the noise of the world, that you would follow heaven's Twitter handle in the word and take that with you into this week. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your holy word. And we want to walk in your commands. We want to enjoy your your presence. You've brought peace into our life. You've reconciled us to God. You've put your spirit in us. We're, We're not left as orphans. You've not left us alone. You've given us a comforter. You've given us a people where we can belong. You've given us your word to guide us, Lord. And and what more could we want? So help us, God, not as Ben prayed. Help us not be lazy. Help us not be neglectful. Help us not be concerned with all the wrong things but the right things that move your heart that you call us to. Shape and fashion us by your word and let us be a city on a hill, a light in this world. For Jesus' sake, amen.